Farland and we are living we are streaming live to YouTube and Facebook. This is something I hadn't really done before, but we're going to test it out today and see how it goes. So I'm going to turn up my headphones here just so I can hear my vocal over my head a little bit better. And I'm plugged straight into my Headrush gig board right now going through my Focusrite Scarlett 18i8 interface. And we're going to talk about how to monitor your Headrush, specifically the Headrush MX5, which is the U the newest unit on the market. And uh, I'm a little tired, guys. I've, I have a new baby in the house, and we're not getting much sleep. So if I slur my words, I'm not drunk. I'm just tired from taking care of a baby all night. So anyway, probably more than what you wanted to know, but it's fine. Uh, let's look at the connections on the MX-5 real fast and just see what kind of options we have here, okay? So we do have a guitar in, which obviously you want to plug your guitar. You know, let me turn down my volume here. Plug your guitar into the guitar in. That's how you're going to get input into your device. Now, somebody asked the other day, either on a Facebook group or just either in the comments on one of my videos, uh, hey, can you plug like a keyboard or any other input source into this? Yeah, you can. You can literally run anything through the Headrush MX-5 and you can use all the amp sounds if you just want to use it for effects like reverb, delay, maybe some overdrive. Maybe you like to hear tremolo on a uh, keyboard sound or something. You can easily do that. So. Don't think that these products are just for guitar because they're not. You can use them for literally anything you want, okay? Now, the next thing is a expression pedal, and uh, I do have an expression. Um, I have one down there, but I can't get to it right now. But that's where you would hook up a separate expression pedal on top of what you already have built in here on the MX-5. And then we have a effect send and return now this is something there if you want to insert maybe a pedal if you have a line 6 product or a quad cortex or any other Mahler or any other guitar device that you have you can incorporate that into the loop of the MX-5 or any of the other headrest products and you can dial that in into your rig as a effects loop block okay so you can bring that in and out you can connect it to a switch if you want to all that but the most important thing we're going to look at today is the output left and right on the back of the unit and we're also going to look at the headphones option here okay we're not going to talk about recording with the mx5 or anything like that that can be a totally separate live stream or just separate pre-made video but for now we are going to talk about how i monitor and how you can monitor your headrush product but in this case the mx5 so let me check the comments here we got uh some people chiming in we got bill kevin and toms um glad to see you guys if you have any questions let me know but this is going to be a pretty simple straightforward concept here we're like how do we monitor our headrush because some people say well i download rigs and they just don't sound all that good to me I'm not, I'm not getting the same sound as what I hear either in the video or what this guy claims is the, the, the golden sound. is like, oh, it's the most amazing sound I've ever heard. And another guy downloads the same rig and he's like, man, this is total crap. I just, I'm not getting it. Okay, well, let's just talk about a few things here. First of all, we do need to realize that if you are slaying your output you double tap on your uh, your headrest screen here I don't have this plugged in but every headrest product has an input settings and output settings if your output settings is slamming the uh, the output into the yellow and even to the red that is way too hot of a signal and you're more than likely either clipping your mic pre input or your instrument level or line input on your audio interface or you could be sending too much signal to the front of house and the front of house guy is going crazy because your signal is just way too hot. 
So make sure you are sending a nice healthy signal, but not so loud that the next device in the chain is receiving too much of a signal. And it could be distorting that mic pre or line level input, okay? Now obviously I'm wearing headphones right now. And I have the headphones plugged into my Focusrite 18i8. And I'm monitoring through, uh, what is this even called? Uh, the Focusrite control software, okay? I can bring the fader up and down. I can pan it left and right. I can do all kinds of stuff. Um, so obviously that is the first thing that we can do to monitor our head rush is to just plug a headphone straight into the headphones jack and just play silently in your room. Sorry, let me turn my, <laughs> turn my guitar down there. So if you're, if you have a new baby, if you have a wife and kids that, you know, you don't want to bug by rocking out super hard in your living room or maybe your, your man cave or whatever it is, throwing on some headphones and just jamming for however long you want is a great option. And that's something that I do all the time. Uh, you don't, you can have over the ear headphones like this, or you can have ultimate ears or some kind of in-ear system. They call them IEMs or in-ear monitors. And I did get these this past summer at the NAMM show. I've, it's been long overdue for a nice set of, uh, of in-ears. So I'll show you what these are. If it'll focus, kinda. Uh, put them in front of my face. There, something like that. So these are nice. So you, you'll see me wear those from time to time in the live stream, or even if I'm doing a pre-made video, I'll do I'll use the IEMs. And I think, um, I think headphones are great. It's it's a very cheap solution, especially if you just have headphones like this. It's a very cheap solution to monitor yourself without having to spend a lot of money on amplifiers or FRFR speakers or whatever right now obviously if you're in a band practice unless you're all using in-ear monitors you just can't walk around with headphones and not plug your head rush unit into a pa or some other mixing amplifier device that actually amplifies the sound in the room because your drummer and bass player and singer and other guitar player and keyboard player and banjo player and whoever else is in your band would probably like to hear you in the room as you're playing and not just look at some dude that's wearing headphones the whole time because it doesn't make sense, right? So with that said, let me actually put my guitar down because I don't need my guitar really or really need to play at all for this kind of presentation. Um, so there we go. So other than headphones, how can we monitor our head rush unit? Okay. Now the MX-5 and the gig board and also the pedal board all have quarter inch outputs that we can utilize. I don't know why it's not focusing. I know why it's not focusing because it's set to face and not uh, just a general focus area. So it's fine. Look at your headrush unit and find the output left and right, and that's how you can monitor your headrush. So, what are some options that we have for this? If you have an amp that, I'm gonna use the Blue Guitar Amp 1, for instance, okay? Uh, let me move this out of the way here so I can see. Uh, never downloaded it works for, uh, read the manual. Never read the manual. How dare you, you fiend. No, you're great. I mean, the headrest units are so easy to use that you really don't need to read the manual. But my channel, Dr. McFarlane the Studios, is all about um, video manuals. So hopefully I've, I've fleshed out the manual for you so you didn't have to read it. It just took me hours upon hours of making videos so you can learn how to use your unit. Uh, but that's fine. It is what it is. So Blue Guitar Amp 1, you can, this can be this. It can be any other amplifier that you have, whether it's tube or solid state. 
And if you plug your headrest straight into the input jack, see it's not gonna focus here. You have an input jack on your amp. Now, that is a viable option, but let me, hopefully you can consider a few things. If you are sending a virtual amp model, which is an amp, is a modeling amp, right? So a virtual model of whatever amp you've chosen, whether it's a clean sound or an overdriven or full on heavy metal or whatever it is, whatever preamp you choose in the head rush, if you plug that into the input of an amplifier, you are now essentially doubling up on a preamp sound because any amp you have is gonna have its own preamp. And this one happens to have a clean channel and then three different uh, variations of dirt channels, whether it's vintage, classic, or modern, which is great. Uh, I would caution you not to plug a headrush model, amp model, into an already overdriven amp. That's just a recipe for disaster. It's gonna sound horrible. And why is it gonna sound horrible? Well, you're gonna, whether this is say you're taking a already overdriven Marshall amp sim and plugging it into the input of an already overdriven preamp on your amplifier, well, that's just overdrive on top of overdrive, this preamp characteristic on top of this preamp characteristic. And it's just try it. You're gonna quickly see that it's not great, okay? So anybody, and that, uh, I bring that up because there's been a lot of people, not a lot, but just I see multiple posts in the Facebook groups that they're like, hey, I'm using my headrush with my Bugera, or I'm using it with a Marshall or a Fender or a you know, Fender Twin, or which doesn't even have an effects loop on it, but we'll get to the effects loop here in a second, okay? We're like, I'm plugging this in and I'm not getting the sound, man. What's the sound? Uh, you know, all these guys claim that this, the head rush sounds amazing, but I'm not hearing that through my amp. Well, you're essentially getting that response because you're plugging into the input of your amplifier. And I'm going to say that's probably not what you want to do. Now, if you're using your head rush only for effects, okay? and you have a fairly clean tone on your amplifier, you can use the input of your amp all day long and it'll sound just fine. So essentially it's like you have your, your compressor, your, you know, maybe your pre-dirt modulation effects. Like for me, I like to use phase and flange before any kind of dirt because I just prefer that placement of pedals. Um, then you have your overdrives and then maybe you have your post dirt modulation effects like for me that would be chorus tremolo vibrato uh, I mean whatever else there is right um, and then you will have your delay and your reverb so all those effects going into a, the input of a clean amplifier will actually sound pretty good because it's just like you're plugging into an amp with no uh, no effects loop and you're keeping it fairly clean and it's just people have done it for literally decades at this point okay uh, I don't even think in the 60s or 50s and 60s they even had effects loops maybe effects loops didn't even show up until maybe the 70s or something I don't remember I'm not a great historian on uh, uh, you know amplifiers and when different features came out or whatever but you know there's go watch rick beato or something like that if you want to learn more about those kind of things or even five watt world uh, he's a really cool guy to watch if you're interested in like the history of things um but yeah so input of your amp you can do it but i want to expect to use your amp sims going into the input of your amp only effects okay only effects okay now the next section of an amplifier that is beneficial for us as modelers you know people who use modelers is not the effects send because that's essentially taking the preamp section of your amp and sending it out to something else 
But if we use the effects return of your amplifier, that's essentially bypassing all preamp gain staging on your amp, which means the gain, the EQ, uh, anything that comes before the master volume, if it even has a master volume. But essentially we're bypassing the preamp of the amp and we're sending a signal straight from the head rush, preferably left mono, straight into the effects return. So now, and I have multiple videos showing how to do this uh, with the head rush and blue guitar amp one and uh, probably some quilter stuff I've had over, over the years or whatnot. Um, but essentially this is the concept you need to get in, in your head. You are sending your amp sim, amp simulation sound, whether that's a Fender, Marshall, Bogner, Ecstasy, whatever you have, right? Whatever the head rush has. You're sending, you're using the head rush now as a preamp because you you just now replaced the preamp of your of your amp. And now you're using your amplifier only as a power amp and possibly a speaker. Well, not possibly, you are using it as a speaker. Um, the only question at that point is, do you prefer the sound of your impulse response or stock cab now going into a physical speaker, which is now doubling up the sound of your speaker sound. Okay. So just like sending a preamp or a amp model into the front end of an amp, you're doubling up the preamp. If you double up, if you send a cab sam or IR into a FX return, you're essentially doubling up the cab sound, which may or may not sound that great. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. It doesn't matter if you have an amp one, you have a Marshall DSL 100 a Fender twin or a Princeton or a deluxe reverb, whatever amp you have, if it doesn't have an effects loop, then you can't do their effects return thing. Then just keep it clean. Uh, plug your head rush into the input and I would strongly urge you just to use it as effects because you're essentially saying okay I already have a really great clean sound now let me just add some effects and you'll sprinkle some effects in there to uh, you know spice things up a little bit maybe you want to add some tremolo maybe a little bit of slap back delay for like a country slash rock blues kind of thing uh, maybe you want to throw in some ambient, you know, wet effects like really long reverbs and delays and shimmer effects and whatever else. So uh, if you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, let me show you real fast. Um, this is a Boss Katana. It's a little heavy. Uh, let me read the comments real fast. Uh, Studio monitors, if we're using interface. Uh, yes. Quarter inch outputs to... Uh, not. You don't have to do it directly to studio monitors, but I would go through an interface first. Well, if you're reamping, if you're using the head rush as your interface, then yeah, just plug it straight into your studio monitors for that situation. Um, and that will work for that. And uh, yes, I abused your videos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Streamlabs OBS does not allow me, at least I don't think. Yeah, it doesn't allow me to. Uh, Yeah, it didn't allow me to put comments on the screen. At least I don't think anyway. It's all good. Uh, Hiram Rodriguez has subscribed to the channel. Thanks, Hiram, uh, wherever you are. Uh, okay, so Boss Katana 
is something slightly slightly different from your typical amplifier and you're not gonna be able to really see this that well um, but the Boss Katana 100 watt version whether you have the head or the combo this does have an effects loop send in return but it also has a power amp in section so what that does is if I use the effects return I can still use my uh, the effects on here because uh, I guess these wet effects are coming after the uh, you know in the power amp section so therefore they're not being bypassed but if I use the power amp in on this amp which I know some really old PV amps have power amp in options uh, there's also some really old uh, other other amps that have been made over the last probably 30 40 years have some kind of power amp in option and that's a great way to say okay I'm gonna send uh, from the output of my head rush uh, send a signal out and then plug it into the power amp in of whatever amp you that has it in this case is a boss katana and um, and this is this is a great option this this boss katana will cost you about 350 bucks 375 whatever it is which is very very comparable to the uh, the 12 inch version of the headrush FR FR speaker so if you want a real amp that still has good preamp sounds and has tons of tons of other effects and and overdrives and lead and crunch channels and just all kinds of stuff is this is a great amp for uh you know your practice space jamming in your house if you just want to plug straight into an amp and play and not really deal with a bunch of you know amp simulation type stuff okay so there's that um I think it's it's not heavy, but if you're sitting down and trying to pick it up, it's it's a little it's a little heavy. Okay, so we've talked about amps and the the reasons why you would want to use the input jack versus the effects return jack. Okay, um, I do have a tip jar on the screen here, and I just really I'm kind of messing around with Streamlabs OBS and uh, seeing what options there are there. Um, you can donate if you want, but I highly suggest going down to the description of this video and either buying a Sonic DNA IR pack, which is my personal Dr. McFarland uh, impulse response pack, which is my version of uh, essentially taking two faders, moving it back and forth and adjusting the balance of two different mics on a, on a speaker or a uh, or two by 12 cab or whatever you have okay <coughs> excuse me all right I don't I don't have the sticker taken off of this yet but this is a FR FR 108 and this essentially is a line input it receives line inputs from a line output device which is what a head rush is head rush is not sending a mic pre signal to your mixing board or a uh, or a powered speaker like this okay <coughs> sorry this is receiving line inputs from your mx5 uh, left and right output okay or you could some some people would probably say this is like an impedance mismatch or something, but you could send the headphone output um, to uh, either a left and a right or just a left or whatever you want. Um, let's see if I can get you this cable here. Cable, hello. All right, so this is a TRS cable right here. Hello. TRS cable that would be going out of your uh, head rush and in this case I was I was going out of the headphone jack on my gig board and then the other side which I'm now unplugging from my focus right here this is a dual mono cable option okay so we have TRS on one side 
and a dual mono on the other. Now on Amazon or Sweetwater or wherever you want to get this from, you can get these in different lengths. And I have another cable somewhere that instead of a quarter inch jack on the end, it's actually a one eighth inch jack, which is what the phones the phones jack right here. These really small, tiny jacks. This is what those are, okay? Those are eighth inch jacks. So if you have the MX-5, you can go eighth inch out into uh, a dual mono cable. And essentially you would go gray on the left, red on the right. You would adjust, um, you know, probably start with five on the uh, on the volume knobs back here and then you would adjust your main uh, your main knob right here on the gig board so your <laughs> your main knob right here it's hard to look backwards on the on the screen so the main knob you just bring that up until you get to about the volume that you want and for I think I don't know if these went up in price at all, but they should still be about two hundred nineteen dollars. They were one ninety nine I think when they first came out, uh, but over the last year or two or three, they've kind of gone up to two nineteen. And then the uh, the twelve inch version of the FRFR is about three sixty three seventy somewhere in there. Okay, um, if you don't have speakers or you want to pick up another Headrush product or any of that kind of stuff, in the description down below are Sweetwater affiliate links. And they each say like Headrush, Reverend, recording equipment, all the different stuff. So I categorized basically a full list of like all the Headrush products that I recommend and um, you know, a bunch of other stuff. So just go down there, click on Headrush. <coughs> Excuse me, I need some water. And uh, Maybe I'm talking too much. I don't know. Uh, you'll be sent to a Sweetwater uh, access link to where you can see all the Headrush products on one page. You can add them to your cart. And anything you buy through that link does go to help support the channel and what I do here on YouTube and on my website. So if you were going to buy it anyways, then there's links down there to uh, you know help support me and what I do. So uh, FRFR is very small. And I did have two, uh, check, check. I did have two of the 1x12 uh, FRFR cabinets or speakers. And for my space at the old house, uh, in the new house, I got a little bit more space. But for my personal preference and taste and just situation, the the 112 speakers were just way too big and i didn't feel like i needed that big of a speaker in my studio so i sold them both used on marketplace or craigslist or whatever it was and i just got one frfr 108 i did pay for this with my own money uh, oftentimes head rush will send me out products before their release so i can do proper testing and all that different stuff. But I do try to buy most things that I have in the studio because, you know, I'm not out to just get stuff for free. Uh, but if people want to send me stuff, I'll gladly test it out. Like this microphone right here, a company sent that out to me. Um, these are the Stellar, the Stellar X microphones. They look pretty cheap. I mean, they're small. They are relatively inexpensive, but they sound good, I think. And uh, that's what I've been using the stream with uh, as far as microphone goes for uh, the last five or six months. So um, they work good. So if you're interested in saving space and not having too much of a weight issue, then the FRFR 108 is definitely a great option for that. Okay. Uh, Let's talk about let's talk about studio monitors since we had a question about studio monitors. Okay, um, let me read some comments here. Two fifty on Sweetwater. 
Yeah, I did see that the MX-5 went up $100. So it's probably a supply and demand thing. Um, maybe they just need to raise the cost to overcome any kind of overseas shipment type stuff. I don't know. I don't, I don't get into pricing and why things go up and down and fluctuate and whatnot. Uh, but hey, the, the cost of meat has gone up and the gas prices have gone up. So why not? You know, people have to, companies have to stay afloat somehow and pay for their products. So unfortunately, sometimes that falls on the the uh, consumer and you just have to pay a little bit more for the products that you want. So I did notice that though. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, studio monitors. When I am, let me, let me grab a guitar here. When I am dialing in sounds, uh, you know, whether it's live streaming and I'm just dial in sounds or I can't really play cause I just unplugged my stuff. Um, it doesn't even matter. I'm not, I'm not going to play. You don't want to hear me play anyway. I need to, I need to learn a few more licks. I keep playing the same stuff, but most people wonder is like, how do you get the sounds that you get? And my very, very, very simple answer to that question is I treat the head rush, the line six, the whatever gear I have, I treat it like the real thing. Okay. So if you're on a Marshall patch, for instance, and you go and crank the master volume on the amp, you are essentially uh, pushing that amp into power amp distortion and it's not a true volume like a clean volume boost okay so that's why i always say find the tone that you want first and then go into your output settings of the uh, of the rig itself and adjust the output to where you're just about three bars below zero kind of almost pushing into the yellow when you start adding in boosts and stuff like that um, but that's, that's essentially the first thing I, I think about when I'm building rigs and two, um, a lot of how you perceive the sound in the room or, you know, whether you're in a, in a, in a dead bedroom or you're in a very live stage scenario, maybe you're in a bar or a club or a arena or whatever else, if you have you know, tons of reverb in your rig, and then you go into a room that's just naturally reverberant. Well, that extra reverb in your rig that you've dialed in at the house in your dry, uh, you know, very contained sound, uh, either studio or bedroom or whatever it is, man cave. Um, I think you're, you're gonna get a little too much of a, like a washy sound when you go play live okay so you may want to back off your wet effects just a little bit i try to keep mine around the you know 20 to 30 percent range somewhere in there because i know if i start getting into the 40 the 50 the 60 that's just way too much delay reverb and your notes are not going to be clear there's not going to be any clarity in your sound at all Okay, so that's really, there's no secret sauce to this. I mean, really guys, there's really not. You just make sure you're not slamming the output. Make sure your wet effects aren't just like over the top, unless you're just going for like a really ambient sound, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but most of the time you wanna keep your reverb delays kind of low in the mix and make sure your, your amp and your overdrive pedals are just getting the clarity that they need, okay? Another thing to consider when building your rigs is not turning up the gain on your pedals or your amp really past like maybe 30 to 40%. Because especially on amplifiers, really high gain amps like the Saldanos, uh, you got the new, uh, you, know, um, you know, Powerball 2, uh, the Engle amps, stuff like that. It already has so much gain on tap that once you start getting past like the 50 to 60% range, 
you're not really adding any more gain. You're just adding more noise and just, you know, uh, just nasty stuff that really didn't need to be in the signal. So keeping the gain kind of low, and then if you need to push it with pedals like a Tube Screamer or maybe a White Boost or any of the other new overdrives that Headrush has introduced in the uh, 2.3 and 2.4 updates, uh, you can totally do that. But just stay conservative on the gain, so that way your gain staging from uh, you know guitar input to first dirt pedal to maybe second dirt pedal then to the front end of your amp and then to your wet effects it's all not one thing is not overly it's not overdoing it right you're you're not over pushing certain things going into your signal um but in my personal opinion whether you dial in your rigs either on headphones or through studio monitors or you're listening through your FRFR 108 or anything, you should have a pretty consistent sound from one venue to the next or one bedroom or den or living room or man cave or, you know, live stage. Maybe you're, maybe you're playing the Grand Ole Opry or maybe you're playing somewhere in Detroit and, you know, some big club out there. I mean, I think if you if it sounds good at the house and then you get to the stage and you just have this overwhelming feeling of like oh man it's not sounding anywhere near how it was at the house what happened well you're now in you're now in a new environment and you are essentially you're just perceiving the sound a little bit different than how you were back at your house or your practice space. And I would really urge you not to go tweaking a bunch of stuff. Send your signal to the front of house guy and let him adjust the sound as he needs to. And he's there to mix your sound and the band on stage. So let him do his job and don't worry about uh, controlling every little thing on the stage because it's just not possible and I mean I understand if you feel like your sound is bad then you're not going to play as good I mean I, I fully understand that concept and it's perfectly fine um, <coughs> but at a certain point you just have to trust yourself be like all right they sounded good at the house when I go play live I have no reason to think that I'm not sounding good in the room Okay. Now, if you're trying to listen through, uh, I mean, I don't have a good example here, but maybe like the old, like Apple earbuds, like the little white earbud things. Um, maybe you're perceiving the sound a little differently than what your what the sound really is. But if you have any kind of, I mean, these headphones right here, these are like seventy dollar headphones. I think these are the um, Audio Technica. Yeah, M40X. There's like the 20 and a 30 and a 40 and a 50 and you know, a whatever. But these are these are like $70 headphones and these sound great. Um, I recently mixed an EDM song with nothing but a laptop and these headphones. I didn't even listen through studio monitors. And I sent it to the client and he was like, hey, that was great. I think the song sounds good. It's all right. If they sound good in here, they should sound good in a live PA system and they should sound good in your you know if you have in your monitors they should sound good in there they should sound good through your studio monitors through the effects return of an amplifier as long as you understand that if you leave your IR or cab sim on you're doubling up on that uh, on that speaker sound so maybe you want to experiment on that um, let me, let me read the comments here just a little bit. Make sure I don't uh, forget about you guys. I'm just talking away here. But I really don't want to go more than about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, let's see. Yeah, stuck in playing the same stuff as well. Yep, it's just the way it is. Uh, I bought a power cab and it sounded horrible using line out setting. 
uh, power cab. Yeah, so Line 6 has a powered a powered speaker option. They basically make it look like a um, you know like a real speaker cab, and you can I think there is a powered version and maybe a non-powered version, and you can um, use IRs in there or you can just use their stock speaker sounds. I was working at Guitar Center. Uh, the when was it? Uh, the last half of 2019 going a little bit into the 2020 and I did have the opportunity to try out a Kemper and obviously we had all the line six and head rush stuff I tried it through that line six uh, cab and I agree I, I didn't think it sounded all that great um because because really what you're trying to recreate is the feel and the sound of a real amp going through a real speaker cab in a room. And it's really not what you're, it's really not the intention. I mean, I know that's what you want it to be like, but it's really not what it's supposed to be like. Headrush or any, any other uh, modeler out there. They're, they are essentially giving you a very, very well recorded sound that you can now monitor through either IEMs, studio speakers, or FRFR speakers. Okay, I know Tracy Guns, uh, you know, from LA Guns. He's a big, you know, headrush guy, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, Tracy Guns, he has uh, two Marshall half stacks behind him on stage. But he's essentially using the effects return of those amps and only using them for like one for show and two just like to blare volume out into the room. And uh, I think he does maybe have like a 112 FRFR speaker in front of him, possibly. Because uh, I know with the with the pedal board, you can send you can actually send a alternate output signal from the XLR outputs, from the quarter inch outputs. You can't do that with the gig board or the MX-5. It'd be really cool if you could, but the pedal board is the only one that has that um, that capability and functionality. Um, so I know that's what he's using it for, uh, but I forgot what the question was at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's keep reading, keep reading here. Uh, TL says, hey, Doc, your patches are awesome. Hello from UK. Hello. Uh, thanks for that. Um, another thing that I don't, I'm not sure if you're aware of, if you go to my website right now, you can, you can pay $20. You can get access to all the rigs that I build in my live stream, which I have. Uh, I started that back in July of last year. I'm just going to keep it going for until the Lord comes back or something, right? So, um, so yeah, twenty. Just think of the twenty dollars as a one-time donation, and you get all these rigs essentially uh, for free after that. Uh, so, if you want to help support the channel and what I do on the website, that's a great way to do that. Um, so, if you've downloaded anything from my website as far as rigs or whatever you want to call them, patches. Uh, that's a great way to get at least four or five rigs a month and uh, yeah all that fun stuff so uh, Lance says my sound is great with headphones but I like I like 10 when I plug it into but it's like 10 when I plug into a power cab okay uh, <clears throat> So power cab, you mean like the FRFR 108, like a headrush powered speaker or like the Line 6 power cab or what are you talking about? Because um, like I said, if you're sending an, a cab and IR out of your headrush into another, like a Line 6 power cab that already has a speaker emulation on it, you're doubling up on that speaker sound and you don't want to do that. So you either need to turn off the uh, speaker emulation on the power cab or turn off the cab or IR in the head rush. Okay. Um, Tom says, I mostly just back the levels down, undo some minor reverb or delay adjustments. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. 
because at home in my headphones, but when I play with my friend, they have three different practice spaces and each room has its own dynamics. Uh, not all rooms are created equal. That is diff this is for sure. Um, uh, some rooms, if they don't have any treatment at all, you can have a very big buildup of bass frequencies in the corners which is why you don't want to put your FRFR speaker right up against the wall because then you're going to perceive that sound as being extra bassy when in reality it's not. You're just, if you were to back off that speaker from the wall a little bit. Um, also, some people suggest to put your speaker kind of maybe a foot or so off the floor so that way all that extra resonance off the floor is not... Um, just like throwing off your perception of what the sound is. Uh, so yeah, uh, acoustic panels in your practice space is a huge investment and it's way more important than any microphone, any studio speaker that you have. If your room is not dialed in to uh, one control frequency ranges and then two control like the way the sound reverberates around the room, then you're going to have a huge problem when you start uh, dialing your dialing your sounds at home and then taking it to the practice space and wondering why it's sounding so drastically different. Okay, uh, that, that, that's what I'm dealing with right now. We're currently in the in the final stages of the drywall of the new studio, and it's very reverberant in there. But I want to wait until we get the doors installed get everything done in the room so I can just kind of stand there maybe play guitar or you know just sing or do something in the room and listen and be like all right we definitely need some bass traps we need to put some panels up on the ceiling maybe on the side of the walls and just start controlling the sound a little bit more uh, than just a big open room okay <clears throat> let's see here uh, uh, Tom says he only has the pedal board. That's fine. Just sold my GT6 to pay the water bill. Yeah, man, that, I, I get it. Uh, if you're ever back on my feet, you're, you got my support. Tom, don't worry about anything, okay? Uh, just watching and, and commenting on my videos is, is more than enough, okay? Um, uh, Lance, we like Line 6. Roger that. Yeah, the Line 6 Power Cab. It can sound weird. Uh, to me, it sounded weird. Um, I wasn't getting... I think I think this little FRFR108 sounds better than pretty much all the other power cabs that I've tried. Uh, <clears throat> if you watched my video sometime last year of me comparing the FRFR108 to a Laney uh 112 which is a powered cabinet but it's made to look like a real cabinet um i for said the for the 700 dollars that that thing was i wasn't impressed um i thought the frfr 108 sounded way cleaner and just way it just sounded better in the room than the laney did and for that price it just didn't make sense to keep it so i did buy it through zounds because i never could find one here locally to try out so i bought it through zounds because uh, i don't think they had it at sweetwater sweetwater doesn't carry laney products so yeah purchased it through zounds got it in the mail probably kept it for about two weeks or so to do all my testing and demonstrations then i just sent it back um uh, yeah, the sound wasn't there for me. For me, the sound wasn't there. I know there are some guys on the Head Rush Facebook group that swear by the Laney 112 cabinet. And if that's what you like, great. But for me, for the for the price and the size and the weight, the Head Rush FR FR 108 is perfect for what I do. And honestly, 90% of the time I'm either listening through headphones through in-ear monitors or through my studio monitor. So I'm not really a live player. Even when I play at church, we, we have uh, in-ears um, on stage. So I don't even use my FRFR 108, really. But I am going to a surprise birthday party 
that the uh, the birthday boy is throwing his own party. <laughs> so that's how that works. Hey, if you want a great party, just make it yourself, you know, uh, get all the details together. But I will be using my Headrush and FRFR 108 uh, for that uh, birthday jam session. We just kind of get up on his stage that he made in his uh, little garage in his backyard. And we just jam for two hours, three hours sometimes and just they'll call out songs and we'll just start playing and it's fun. So I could I could definitely use the 108. I might bring the boss katana and just uh, use the amp the power amp in on that and maybe take a MX5 or take my gig board or whatever I want to do. So there's a lot of options there. Yeah you can use the amp stand to get off the floor. That's that is true, Kevin. Uh, do you have any bass guitar patches? Well, TL, let me tell you what I do about bass guitar. I go to the dot, dot, dot. I make a new rig. Uh, this is a, let me save something real fast. I click on the, uh, the button to uh, add an amp. And I go to the... Uh, the really there's two amps right now in the headrest the blue line scoop and the blue line bass i like the blue line bass because it's essentially the same as like a ampeg svt or something and then i'll go to my cab and i'll bring in the uh what is it what is it the eight by ten blue line and that is my bass sound Okay, I, I might put in a compressor. I might, for like maybe a rock song that I want the bass to sound a certain way, I might put on a, uh, a chorus pedal. I know, um, shoot, what's that band? There's a lot of metal and hard rock bands nowadays, like more modern bands. The bass player will put a little, just a little bit of chorus on his guitar, on his, uh, his bass tone. And that just helps him stand out a little bit more in the mix, and uh, you know, add some add some width to the sound a little bit. Um, but for bass, I mean, I'll just I'll take my bass, I'll plug it in, make sure I have that Ampeg and the eight by ten cab on there. I might mess around with the uh, the microphones just a little bit, but really, just those two elements a little bit of compression and i'll record it straight into my doll and then from there i can eq and compress even more i can add more effects in the doll if i want to i think bass um bass should just be simple you know if you want to add a delay or something great if you want to add like an auto filter like an auto wall kind of thing for like some funk stuff you know you can sprinkle some stuff in like that uh, maybe add a phase or something flange. Uh, but yeah, I, for me personally, my base patches are literally the amp and the cab, a little bit of compression and that's it. That's all you got. Um, so I'm sorry. I don't have more base patches than that, but that's literally all I do. Okay. Eli Stone is in the house. I was practicing for church, but I saw you were live. <laughs> you better get back to practice that, Eli. Uh, James Hall says, hey, Doc, thanks for all the uh, kick-ass headrush presets. You're welcome, James. Uh, Francis, which is the padded, padded pedal room guy, says, hey, Doc. And Tom says, um, if you want it done right, do it yourself, even as if it's a potty. Woot woot. That's right. If you want, to, if you want a really good party, man, you gotta just plan it yourself. You can't expect things to your friends and family to do it for you. Uh, yeah, bass is the best. Is simple. It's rare to me that it needs a lot. Yeah, like why even need a uh, like a reverb or stuff like that on a bass. I mean, to me, it just doesn't make sense. Bass is just there to keep the low end. Um, now, in the latest 2.4 update, there is, if you go to the distortion section, there is a B distort, B dist 7000. 
that is a um, a base pedal that you can add just like a little bit of grit. That's another great way to help the bass stand out in a dense mix. If you're doing jazz, don't put distortion on your bass. But if you're in a rock band, you want to stand out maybe on the chorus. Maybe there's a bridge section coming up that you just want to, you know, kind of beef up the bass sound a little bit. Then, yeah, kick in a Tube Screamer, kick in this B, B Dist 7000 uh, pedal. I think it's called uh, from like Dark Glass Company. I'm not even sure. I don't even care. Just, hey, it's a, it's a bass distortion pedal. Great. Let's throw it in and see what we can do. Uh, before I posted the latest uh, live stream rigs on my website, I did grab my bass and just kind of tweak. I went through all the presets and just kind of found something that worked uh, for what I would use it for here in the studio. So if you want to check those out, once again, go click on HTS Rigs, pay your $20, and you get all the rigs that I've created and will ever create in the future uh, for just that one, one price. So um, I did add a bundle, and this is something to where I want uh, I want my viewers and people who have already purchased things through my website. I want to get your feedback on this. I am starting a new series just on the website called Tonal Analysis, and I'm going to be picking uh, bands and or just songs, and I'm going to be breaking them down uh, part by part. Not really how to play them, but definitely how to dial in uh, very, very similar tones to what you hear on the album. Uh, whether that be blues, rock, jazz, country, uh, death metal, whatever it is. Um, so send me your suggestions for bands that you want me to cover in that series. And there is a bundle on my website right now. This is basically a Headrush bundle where you get the uh, Headrush Tone Sculpting, you get the HTS Rigs, and all the Tonal Analysis uh songs bands slash songs uh for one price so uh, i don't have any tonal analysis uh videos yet but i did just have a baby and i'm definitely going to start getting into that uh, probably next week so i have a few bands and songs already in mind but i would love to hear your suggestions so i can know uh what you're interested in you know what kind of music do you want to learn how to dial in the sounds from because uh, it might be good if you're in a cover band or you just want to learn more about training your ear to hear like the little nuances and in, in, in the in the shift of sound and whatnot and just know like hey what amp should i choose what effects should i choose what are the proper settings to get the right sound for that song um and this is another, this is let me talk about this just for a little bit this would be cool the nice vi sound yeah they're working on it just ain't quite right yet uh oh shoot what was i gonna say what was i gonna say oh i know what i was gonna say um the sound you hear live is most of the time a little bit different from what you actually hear on the album or the record, whatever you want to call it. So when you're in the studio, you have a lot of liberty and leeway to shape the sound, whether you're just taking a mic in front of an amplifier, then recording it, and then using a bunch of plugins or maybe some hardware EQs and compressors to further shape the sound. And that's one thing you got to consider when you're listening to these albums. It's like, okay, I hear, let's, let's take an ACDC song, for instance. Uh, I, I noticed this when I was driving down the road just listening to the radio and an ACDC song came on. It could have been Shook Me All Night Long. It could have been uh, Hell's Bell, whatever it was, right? But to me, the sound of the guitar was definitely a very big, roomy sound. So maybe they had a mic on like right on the speaker cab itself, but they could have had a mic maybe five to 10 feet away, picturing up the all, you know, pick, uh, picking up the, the room ambience of the, of the room they were in. 
And what's great about the head rush is if you go to your reverb and delay settings, you have an air reverb and you also have an 11 reverb that gives you like an arena, big theater, bright hall, cathedral, church, early reflections, uh, jazz club, you know, all the different plates and room options. So that's how you can really, you can start off with a, with a nice dry sound, and then you can accentuate that sound with whatever room type or hall or just reverb type that you want to hear. So uh, sometimes having a very, very fast uh, decay and a very low mix can definitely help uh, bring out like the, uh, the spatial characteristics of what you want. Let me let me plug this back in here. I'm gonna click on my headphones, and then let's plug in this cable back into the all right. I'm going into the line inputs here. Line input on the back of the focus right. And let me make sure I do this right here. Um, this guitar is the Reverend Gristle Master from Greg Cock. And let me let me get rid of this bass and cab. Let me just pull up an amp. Let's do the, the EPB clean. And I'm just gonna bring in a cab, which is the four by 12 uh, Classic 30. I kinda like using the, the 414 mic off axis here lately. Uh, but you can use whatever you want, so. I'm on clean. Let's turn the gain down a little bit. I don't have uh, if I turn on my epoch cam here, it might it might work. Yeah, there we go. See if I can unplug it. I can put it over here. And maybe you can see it like that <laughs> all right hold on there we go yay we can see it kind of okay so it's a uh, it's pretty good pretty good i'm not gonna worry about too much so let's get dial in a good clean sound <laughs> whatever it is right so let's talk about well, I'm, I'm obviously using headphones right now so I can really hear meticulously the sound of like an early reflection uh, digging the IR is great Francis I'm glad you like them um, I really like the air the 11 they are good that's what I use are those two. Uh, I see. I knew we can get you playing. <laughs> All right. So early reflections. If we turn down the de the, the, the decay. Usually, I like to tone down a little bit just to darken it up. See the mix is on 45, let's turn that down. It really just depends on what you're going for. Okay, let's throw in a, uh, let's bring these down. Let's throw in a distortion. Okay, cool. Um, I really like the garage setting in here. Where's my garage? Check this out. 
Okay, so that gives you a sense of just a little bit of width in your headphones, especially if you're using in-ears on stage. You can bring the mix down a little bit. And we got that versus turning off the reverb. You're like, okay, it sounds good dry, but if we turn on just a little bit of ambience, it just gives you that sense of space of being in a room. And uh, I think it sits better in the mix um, to me. If you have just a little bit of spatial recognition going on there. Uh, just checking the comments here. We are uh, at an hour and five minutes, so I'll probably close it down here in a little bit. Um, I was just going to sit here and record a bunch of pre-made video stuff, but uh, uh, live streaming is more fun. So, And I don't have to do extra work of editing after the fact. Uh, Francis is asking how the studio build is going. Uh, we are finishing up drywall possibly uh, tomorrow. Uh, my contractor is doing the last little bit of mudding and taping, getting all that sorted. And we should be able to start painting uh, early next week. So it's pretty exciting. Then after the first coat of primer, we can put in the doors and then finish off the paint. And then uh, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're definitely getting there. Okay. Um, let's go with something a little bit longer on the reverb. And let's do a echo room short. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, but let's try something else here. Uh, Rich Hall is really nice. Okay, I have the mix on 20%. Uh, let's see what happens. Yeah, I can zoom in a little bit. Just a little bit here. Move the phone over. Yeah. All you really need to see is the screen there. So. Now we can add some decay to this. Tom says he likes the garage setting. It it does open things up a bit for sure. Uh, glad you were able to catch uh, the live stream. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. It's, it's no fun hanging out with uh, nobody watching. So, now I think personally, if you listen to like 80s, any kind of 80s music, you are going to have a lot of reverb in the mix. So a lot of your Bon Jovi, your your White Snake, your Rat, your Poison, you know all the '80s hair metal bands. They had they had some a lot of big arena type effects in their mix. If you listen to like Def Leppard, you got that that snare sound, like the gated snare, the big your roomy reverbs on the vocals and whatnot. I mean they they just drenched everything in reverb. And then really in the 90s, it got more dry. Uh, Nirvana, you don't really hear any reverb at all on their guitars and vocals. You hear some natural room reverb on the drums because they recorded in a nice big room. But uh, the 90s were pretty much dry as far as guitar effects and vocal effects go. And then the 80s was like the big, uh, big reverb type sounds. And then as you started going to like early 2000s, we got, you know, boy bands, we had pop. And uh, I think I think nowadays you kind of hear a good blend of like dry production versus um, like wet, more reverby type productions. Uh, some producers and engineers and mixing engineers will use delay on vocals instead of reverb because delay just adds a little bit of... Um, just a little bit of space without being too wet. So for instance, if I put on like a tape echo here, uh, let's just do basic preset. Okay, obviously that's 
a little too long, but if I bring the mix down, maybe change the delay, like a little shorter milliseconds. So delay can go a long way in just adding more spatial awareness to your sound without having to use reverb. But if you want to, let me turn the sync on. Let's put this on core note delay. Maybe turn the mix back up a little bit, 30%. Okay, let's go into hardware assign and let's uh, take the cab. We're gonna assign the tap tempo here. Put it on the end, put that there. Uh, we'll bring the tape echo on to that one. All right, it's fine. Uh, verb settings, it doesn't matter what I, well, I call it. So tap it in. Okay, that sounds good. Let's do um, three sixteenths, which is a dotted eighth delay. One, two, three, four. Ah, uh, one, two, three, four. Francis's favorite reverb is the medium plate. Well, let's check it out. Let's check that out. Rachel medium, medium plate. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to our amp head here and let's go to the crunch channel. Yeah, it's good. That's good. Maybe turn the decay down. All right. Uh, yeah, so all that was dialed in with headphones. If you feel like that's a little too wet, you can back off the reverb and delay a little bit. And we can turn those off with the switch. Yeah, the plate is a very classic reverb to choose. Uh, most studios over in, you know, across the pond, London, British, uh, wherever they are, uh, some here in America, uh, they either have a chamber, which is like a big room that's very reverberant. They have a speaker, like a, either a one speaker setup with a stereo uh, XY pair or maybe a space pair. Where's my hands? Space pair. Um, in the room, and then they can send different tracks to that chamber and then return it back on another fader and that's how they get reverb sends and returns in a uh, big time big time old timey studio but nowadays we just have it all in our doll we can add a reverb plug in and then send whatever track we want to the reverb and it just automatically you know pulls up and returns on the same channel so uh but yeah the other thing is uh plates that which is like a actually huge uh, metal plate with electric 
wires all connected to it and they when you send a signal through it it the plate moves and reverberates and then that's how you get a nice plate reverb so uh so you either got room reverbs which is chamber is another way just another version or variation of a room then you got actual plate reverbs so it's really the only two kinds you can have uh i mean i'm sure there's other variations of a plate but essentially you either got a spatial room type reverb or you just have a a plate type reverb if there's another one that i'm forgetting let me know <laughs> Tape echo, turn it on. All right, pretty fun. Uh, just for fun, let's go to my website real fast. And I'm going to go to, uh, let's go to the back end here. Let's go to podia.com which is a new website uh, creation tool that I found this last year. This is actually saving me some good money and it makes it very easy to create courses and digital products. Um, I'm gonna go to my products here and let's go to uh, Killer Backing Tracks. Uh, this is the blues option, it is $9 to purchase uh, the blues backing tracks. And I also will be adding more and more um, blues back in tracks uh, very, very soon. Uh, let's swing blues, easy major blues. Yeah, let's do this in C. All right, so check this out. Hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll play. Maybe. Yeah, here we go. Let me know if that's too loud. Let me go to my blues rig I just made for the live stream. This has the uh, the clean angle powerball. Add in some overdrive, some S1 drive. Okay, let's try out the Octafuzz. Next pick up. Ah, uh, ah. Uh.
put in the SD1 in front of that. Try the 250 drive. Let me make sure my settings here are uh, looking okay. Let's turn up the playback. There we go. Major blues. I was trying to drive up on this thing. Uh, what is interesting here, let me turn this blues off, the blues, uh, what's interesting about the 250 drive is it kind of sounds a little fuzzy to me, um, I always thought the DoD 250 was more like, not really transparent, but just didn't have as much fuzz inherently in the sound as I, uh, as apparently it does, so unless Headrush just didn't um you know model it that great but you know it is what it is i still like my favorite overdrive in the head rush is still like the anxiety uh whether you have the original or the version two it doesn't matter to me um but i just like i like the uh anxiety overdrive let's turn down the level turn down the drive a little bit because really you can get a nice uh, edge of breakup sound with it or you can push the drive a little bit turn down your volume on your guitar. It's just a nice overall overall sound. Especially if you just have a clean tone on your amp, just kick in a little uh, OCD and uh, you got a good, good overdrive there. Um, OTS dialed in. Oh yeah, yeah. I like the I like the uh, anxiety myself. Um, if there's any, I mean, I do like the black op. I, like, I mean, the DC distort is nice. Uh, let's try that one real fast. <laughs> very bright. 
right sound. So you might want to uh, maybe bring down the bass, bring up the treble. Can't turn up the gain. So really without amp channels themselves, you can have a lot of wide variety, a lot of variety uh, in your dirt just by choosing different, uh, you know, dirt pedals on the screen there. So I think that's about all for me, guys. Um, yeah, the Black Op is great. I've compared the Black Op to an actual rat from the 80s and uh, also the Wampler Rats Bane. And I think they're all within the ballpark of each other for sure. Um, they all sound really close to each other and especially in the mix, uh, they all sound, you can give them the sound however you want in the mix. So, all right guys, I'm going to uh, regroup this weekend and make a list of of different video topics I'm going to start cranking out next week and uh, more content will be added to the website I have a new drum set over here which I don't know if you can see that or not um, this is the Roland VAD uh, 503 with additional crash uh, and splash symbol and some other stuff so um, I'm gonna be doing some live streams with uh, with the drum set and also a superior drummer and uh, once, once the studio is done and ready to be moved in and functional I'm definitely going to be cranking out some cool videos in that space but right now I'm just in the corner of a bonus room in a house and uh, I'm just kind of limited on on the setup and the workflow and all that stuff. So I'm just trying to keep it easy for now. Wow, I said man three times. Yeah, you did. <laughs> man. Man. Uh, Lucas says, which are your favorite amps overall in the head rush? Um, I really like the orange uh, or the tangerine channel one and channel two. That's just a good... The orange amp is great for overall clean tones. The channel two, you can get some uh, some good crunch, the medium distortion from that amp. Uh, I really like the Mesa Boogie stuff, the vintage or the tread plate and the uh, all that. And, and that's really for like for my overdrive or you know, my heavy stuff. Uh, I mean, obviously Saldano is great. The Bogner stuff is great. But yeah, if I had to make a choice right now, if you had to get rid of everything in the head rush as far as amps go and just keep a few things, uh, I, I would keep the angle because it has four different channels. And there's a lot of variation you can get with that. I would keep the Mesa Boogie stuff and I would keep the, um, the, Fender, the Fender Princeton Reverb. I would keep that. Uh, so really between those, that, that little handful of amps, I can really get any sounds I want. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, maybe throw in a Marshall JCM 800 or something, but I think between the angle and the, uh, what's the other one I just said, the Mesa Boogie stuff, I can get any, any range of dirt that I want from, from those two amps, those two types of amps. And then for the clean stuff, the orange and the Princeton uh, it just does it for me. It just works really well. Now, that's not to say that you can't... I mean, there's there's great sounds to be had from the Bogner Green Channel, the MS, uh, MS-30 or DC-30. Well, it's, just, it's the matchless amplifier. Uh, obviously, if you want to go for a Vox type sound, you can play a Vox. But, you know, at a certain point to me, especially in a mix, a lot of these different cleans and crunch and, uh, you know, heavy sounds just start sounding very very similar uh when you're doing productions so if you just kind of narrow it down to just like hey pick some of your favorite amps that you like and just don't worry about like going through every single uh, variation on sound that you can get 
Um, Because really in the end, as long as you have a good clean sound, a good crunch, and a good lead sound, uh, I mean, really, what else do you need? So, um, but yeah, I think that's it. We've, we've gone for about an hour and a half now, and that's uh, that's plenty for this live stream. So, yeah, JCM 800 is amazing, dude. It is amazing. Uh, my secret for lead tones is just a tube screamer and a little bit of delay. Maybe some air filter to kind of sweep the mid-range frequencies a little bit as you're playing, but... That's really all I do for lead sounds. Uh, I don't get too crazy going into the weeds and you know dialing in a bunch of different stuff for that. So what are you playing through too? Yeah, the rectifier uh, dual, of the JCM eight hundred and the orange is is uh, Lucas's favorite. So yeah, you can't go wrong with those at all. Now, I have a few different options for guitars here. Obviously, you saw me play my Telecaster. I have a Reverend Tensei. I have an Eastman uh, semi hollow body. And also have a, uh, a Reverend Gil Paris signature model, which is basically a Strat with Fishman Fluence pickups in it. So as long as you have a humbucker and a few different kinds of like single coil guitar options, uh, you really can just narrow it down to like two or three amps. And then just switch guitars when you want to get a little bit more of a nuanced sound, whether you're going for that like Sweet Home Alabama or like, Sweet Home Alabama. Well, that's a good example. But, you know, if, like now that I, like a more modern player would be like, if you want to go for the John Mayer sound, right, you want to play a telly. I mean, sorry, you want to play a Strat. If you want to play, uh, I mean, tons of play, people play Telecasters. Obviously, a lot of people play like the Gibson Les Pauls. Uh, Gibson SGs, uh, any kind of humbucker style guitar. Um, as long as you have those variations in your arsenal, especially if you're a recording a studio guy like I am, having the head rush and a few guitars at my disposal, I can get any sound I want. Literally any sound I want. I don't have to look to the Line 6 and the Quad Cortexes and the Kempers and the Fractals and all the different stuff. It literally doesn't matter, okay? You can you can go out and spend three thousand dollars right now if you want, but if you have a head rush, whether that's the MX5, right? MX5, the gig board or the pedal board, you can get any sound you want. If you hear it in your head, you should be able to dial in on this head rush and get a great tone every time, whether you're playing in the studio or the stage. So thanks guys for watching. Uh, we probably had about 20, 22 people at the at the largest amount of viewers for this stream. I did go a little longer than I suspected. Uh, and, and the viewers are dropping off now. Bye. Bye, guys. Uh, but be sure to check the links down in the description if you want to donate to the channel. You can go buy some HTS rigs. You can buy... Um, uh, the Sonic DNA stuff, or you can buy something through my Amazon or affiliate or Sweetwater affiliate links. So thanks guys for watching. I am Dr. McFarland and I'll see you in the next video. Keep rocking.